I want to switch now to talking about choosing to be a leader. And there are many dimensions to considering whether you want to put yourself out to be a leader. And uh, I won't go into all of these. I just wanted to focus on two dimensions which I think are particularly salient. And for me, the most important of these is what is your own motivation for wanting to step up to be a leader? What is it that drives you? Because that motivation, that wish to do this is a strong determinant of your commitment and is a significant contributor to your resilience. So for example, if you take an extreme type of a situation, if your prime motivation was because this is a glamorous job and you know, uh, actually it wasn't quite what you wanted but it's so glamorous, you take the job, uh, you are going to be very happy for two weeks, people will send you cards, emails, you know, champagne. Then two weeks later, you get hit with the reality and you find that your internal motivation is insufficient to carry you through the many difficulties that inevitably every leader will face. Uh, myself personally, uh, Sin Hoon was very kind to talk about uh, some of the opportunities I've had uh, to serve. Uh, when I was uh, asked to be Dean of Medicine, for example, I was just a, a regular consultant. You know? I had zero administrative experience. And I was quite taken aback someday when uh, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Lim Pin, uh, asked to meet me and he said, you know what, you know, do you want to be the Dean of Medicine? And uh, so my draw, jaw dropped and I thought for a minute, you know, really? And so I asked myself, um, when I went back, I mean, why would I want to be Dean of Medicine? And as it turns out, I was uh, quite uh, unhappy with uh, some of the ways we were teaching um, medical students in the 90s and had made a lot of noise about it, right, uh, quite publicly. And that, I thought, was my opportunity to do something to uh, address a shortcoming which I had identified. So the word constructive dissatisfaction is something which is something which I, I, I think quite a lot about. And uh, let me explain what I mean. Now, uh, to be dissatisfied, of course, is quite easy. So in fact, I know quite a number of people who are specialists in uh, being dissatisfied, right? But to convert that dissatisfaction into a positive force for action and change, that is not so easy. And that's why I term constructive dissatisfaction. But if we can convert dissatisfactions with important things into powerful platforms for energizing change, then constructive dissatisfaction, I feel, can be a very powerful motivator of leadership. Similarly, when uh, I had just done three years as dean, I was asked to become director of medical services in the Ministry of Health, and again, I was quite taken aback. I mean, what on earth? I you know, had uh, not done any medical administration before. <coughs> and then I asked myself, uh, well, if I went to the Ministry of Health, what possibly could I do? I am a kidney doctor by training, or I should say I was a kidney doctor. And one of the frustrations we all had was uh, dealing with so many patients with kidney failure who needed dialysis. And amongst our colleagues, we used to gripe about why isn't anybody doing more to prevent people from getting kidney failure, to s reduce the number of people who need dialysis. Why wasn't someone doing more? And then the question, of course, was who should lead the effort to prevent more people from getting kidney failure. And then I thought to myself, when this was put to me to join MOH, well, I think <coughs> MOH can and should take the lead to help prevent disease progression. And therefore, I took this up, and I'm happy I had the opportunity to work on not just kidney failure, but several other diseases where I feel we did make some meaningful contributions to preventing severe complications which need very difficult advanced treatment. Uh, that, I think, was something of great satisfaction for me. 
And the second point I wanted to make about choosing to be a leader, uh, quite often people ask themselves, well, or those people who talk to me ask, well, you know, I'm not sure whether I can really do this job, you know. Uh, is it too big? Is it too difficult? Uh, and I quite often feel that in terms of the technical abilities to deliver, technical meaning the HR, the finance, the, the change management, the technical abilities, often that can be learned, that can be, you can ask people to help. Uh, that usually is not a major limitation if people have the right motivations. But the two things that I often feel are lacking uh, are the right kind of people skills as well as the systems level thinking. Being able to think about issues deep and narrow, but then to also think about the broader systems, connections and implications. And to be able to do both is really important. <coughs> Sometimes people uh, talk to me and they say, well, NUS is such a big organization, you must be very capable to run such a big organization. And I explain, actually, I don't run NUS. I actually manage the 10 people who run the NUS. Uh, one, the, the, one of the most important persons, of course, is Provost Tan Eng Chai, who now will be the new president. You know, most of my job is helping the 10 people who run NUS to work in a cohesive manner with a sense of common purpose. So finally, uh, being an effective leader, there are several elements to this. I'll just uh, make a few points uh, on this theme. Uh, the first, I think it's really important to have a vision of where you want to be. You know, there's the S is, where we are now, and there's the where we want to be. It's really important to have the vision. And this, of course, is not saying anything new. But I want to make the point that quite often, uh, my sense is that we don't spend enough time really drilling deep into understanding what that vision means and why it's important. Uh, Sin Hun has mentioned that our vision in NUS is global university centered in Asia, influence in the future. These are words, but what do they distill down to? What are the most critical elements what are the most important things we have to put in place in order to realize the potential of these ideas, right? I mean, that is the part that needs a lot of thought, a lot of uh, attention. And it actually is a process of distillation. It's not a process of expansion. Quite often, uh, all of us sit through presentations about vision, and they are filled with these slides with arrows running everywhere, boxes, color codes, and so on. Uh, I always ask that we take all those things down and boil it down to the really essential elements, the really critical points, the things that if not done cannot allow us to move beyond where we are. I think that process of distillation, what I call like writing haiku, I think that is what we need in order to take a set of ideas distill it down to what is important, and to then create a sense of collective ownership of that distilled set of ideas, and have this as a way to motivate and energize activities across the institution. So having a vision is really important, and it is closely linked to being able to make things happen. Because we all know that if we spend a great deal of time talking about vision, but it does not translate into perceptible forward motion, then no one's going to be very enthusiastic about this vision. Conversely, if uh, there is a reinforcing cycle between bold new ideas, ability to implement, that then feed into new ideas, if you can have that reinforcing cycle where ideas inform action, then create more opportunities, create more ideas, then I think you have a basis for people to feel energized and to come together to push harder for the institution. The final two things I'll say about this is that fundamentals do matter, and uh, one could be too task-oriented about these things. You should never uh, lose sight of uh, things like HR, incentive systems, and so on. 
Uh, all of you know uh, Mr. Peter Xia. He's uh, one of our corporate titans, one of the most successful uh, industry leaders that we have. And uh, he is also, some of you might not know, the chairman of uh, the Singh Health uh, Medical health, health Cluster. And uh, when I met uh, Peter and asked him, well, Peter, what do you spend most of your time on uh, in Singh Health as the chairman of the board? He said, oh, actually, I only just do one thing. I sit in the HR department. I just look at all the HR issues, you know, because for him, it's a talent organization. Talent is HR. HR is where the focus should be. So we shouldn't forget about the fundamentals. And finally, on this point, I think it's always very important for us to think ahead and say, in five or ten years' time, uh, what would be the one or two things that we have left behind that we have done which would be considered consequential that would mark a significant improvement from what it was before. And it's very important to do this not because you want to leave a legacy, not because you want to then be able to add it to your CV, but because it focuses your mind on what is most important long term. That uh, in the busyness of doing a lot of things every day, we don't forget that we should be building something bigger and longer term which will have more enduring impact. And of some of the things that I have learned personally in my own journey, I would say diversity and uh, networks are very important. Being able to zoom out to see uh, the big picture, the connections between issues, to learn from other sectors, to reconnect it to your own sector, and then the ability to zoom in to understand what are the really fundamental areas that uh, need attention in the institution. That ability to zoom out and zoom in is very important. It's very difficult, but I encourage us all to think about how we could uh, do even better in that regard. And because things are changing so quickly, the, while we have a long-term destination which is shaped by our vision, in fact, uh, in NUS for the last several years, we have been engaged in what I would call more adaptive strategizing. Uh, for myself personally, I spend a lot of my time thinking about our positioning. And I actually learned this from Mr. Dana Balan because uh, we have the great fortune of uh, having Mr. Dana Balan as the chair of our MAB. And when uh, Bernard Jung and I uh, first went to meet Mr. Dana to, ask, to persuade him to take on this, I thought I would try and persuade Mr. Dana by saying, oh, Mr. Dana, look, it won't take a lot of your time. You know, we only have uh, three board meetings, we'll prepare the papers, we'll be very efficient. And Mr. Dana's reply was very, very instructive. He said, look, if I do this, it must be a 24-7 thing for me, right? If I read the Financial Times about something that pertains to business school, I must be thinking about how the business school should respond to it. I would not want this job if I just came and uh, chat a meeting three times a year. So, strategizing is something, I mean, if you have the right motivation, we are continually thinking about positioning. And uh, Eng Chai and myself, the deputy presidents, meet every week. And we have uh, sort of short, half-day, mini-retreats two or three times a year to think about our strategies, our positioning, and how we need to reshape and refine them. Because otherwise, uh, we will not be able to adapt and be responsive enough to a rapidly changing environment. The final, final thing I'll say is uh, pace and balance is something which is very important. And uh, all of you know that I have to make a State of University address every year. And uh, every year I speak a bit about my travels. And every year I ask the team that does the research for me, I say, I talk too much about my travels and maybe this year I should uh, avoid talking about travels, don't show any travel slides at all. And their consistent advice to me is, don't do that, nobody will come, because the only reason why they come for your State of University address is to get ideas of where to go for, for the next holiday. <laughs> so I have uh, continued to show those slides and talk about travel and so on. But the point I'm trying to make is that, uh, you know, this is a, a long-term thing, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And as leaders, a really important thing for us it's not how many hours we put in, but how many uh, outputs we get per unit time. 
And yes, uh, you know, I might go trekking, I might go on holiday, uh, but I, the way I explain it to our board chairman, the time I'm on the job, there's a lot more output per unit time, right? At least that's the theory. So with that, I, uh, maybe I'd like to uh, end here uh, to thank you really for this opportunity to share some thoughts. And since uh, this is a dialogue uh, and not a monologue, I look forward really to your comments, uh, questions. But those of you who are world experts on leadership, uh, you know, please do bear in mind that I'm just a novice in it. Thank you.